So we're going, oh, I have to go quickly into this directory. Uh, let's see where we where we stopped. Oops, ls there. Um, I'll have to check what we what we did last time because I don't remember it anymore. Um, I'll show you. There we go. So we abstracted everything we saw in the main function a lot by having two types of. Um, uh, well, by having extra files, basically, and encapsulating everything into functions. Using the first reason why we would use a function, namely to make sure that the, the main function is not that, uh, not a, bi a big piece of spaghetti code, which we had last time. Now the big piece of spaghetti code is still here in our, in our warm.h and warm.cpp, especially in the warm.cpp. But it's a little bit, a little bit easier to, uh, to get an overview of. Um, let me get uh, the main function here, so that we started in warm uh, version 1.cpp, just to show this in exactly the same file. So the main function here starts here. This is everything that we have in our main function. This is a lot. This is a lot less, and this is very easy to read, right? So if you would know how the warm module that we created now works, then you can basically see more or less what happens here, and you almost don't need any comments here. I would say. Uh, that, that is the ID here. And everything else um, we, we took care of by having a worm.h, a header file, and a worm.cpp. So this is our header file um, where we do certain things. This over here is our cpp file where we basically uh, include our header file and basically also tell uh, how the functions should be defined or what the functions really do. Here you say what the functions are, here what the functions will do. Now at this point in time, all the functions are procedures, mainly, meaning, oh no, most of them. Here's one, uh, but the rest are procedures, meaning they don't return anything and they don't take any arguments as well. So these are fairly dumb functions, but this will change. Okay, now we also saw, don't save that, we basically have what we had. Um, so we basically saw that now, since we have multiple files, we need to take care of, um, of creating first objects and then linking those objects. I think that is where we uh, stopped last time. And that means we have to do with a dash C, say we compile them into an object. So if we then do um, uh, our warm.cpp, for instance, then we create an object file out of this. So in this case, um, warm.o is created after this command. The same for GCC. If you um, if you create a warm of our other CPP file, namely warm v1, um, then this one over here is created. That's what we did already last time. Now we have two object files here that create that basically contain everything that we want in our module and in our main function. So the main function tells us what functions to execute in which order, plus this, end, uh, this while loop to constantly redraw our warm. And our module dictates what those functions should do. And that's nicely divided into those two things. And the way we link that is basically the way we did it by uh, earlier. We basically say we want an object file. We will create exactly the same executable, w1 for instance. And for that, we need those two objects, namely warm, .o and warm version 1.0. And since we are using this library, this library and curses, we also have to include that here. Right. Oh, right. This is something that we did at the end. And, um, and this is something that I still wanted to fix. Exactly. So uh, then we basically fix this first. Because why is this happening over here? The best way to do a look at this is to look both at uh, warm.h and warm.cpp again. So in our header file, um, we have uh, these uh, variables that we declare as global variables. So as soon as in the main function, um, warm.h is, uh, is linked or included at the, at the top, we have these over here. But then we have exactly the same for warm.cpp, the object file. We do exactly the same again. So when we build the object of warm.cpp, so warm.o, 
We also, in that object file, include warm.h. So it's included twice, one in warm v1, one in warm, um, in normal warm, right? So in that case, warm.h is twice executed here. And in this case, twice we have these um, global variables. And that's exactly what the compiler told us here. Whoops. I wanted to exit this here. So our compiler said there are multiple definitions of the variable x, y, c, food, and so on. Right? So what do we do? The, the solution here, or the, the first solution that we go for here, is that we put all of these in our C, uh, C++ file. Let's do this immediately. So we go for warm.h. We quickly put this in here. We don't need all of this. Well, we, we will put all of the variables that we really need in the CPP file. That way, we avoid that these global variables are twice present. Once when we have the warm v1 object and once when we have the warm object. That is, that is the simplest. So in this case, if we uh, clean this over here, you have, oops, undo. In this case, you basically have um, in the header file all the libraries that you need and the definition or the, the, the way, uh, or all, you basically have the list of all the functions that we're going to use. And in the CPP file, we define all those functions. Now, later, we're going to put all these variables in a nicer position. Because as we said last week, global variables are not always the best thing. So slowly, you know, one by one, we will make sure that these variables start disappearing. But for now, we'll put them here as global variables in our CPP file. So if we save that on both cases, and we do exactly the same, so we have to now um, uh, compile warm v1, um, warm as well, and then we have to uh, link everything together. So our library and curses and our two object files, and then this should work. So now we created the warm uh, the the w1 uh, executable, and if we execute that, we have our warm example as we had it last time, except that our main function is a lot smaller and a lot smaller and more uh, it's more visible what we are doing. And um, if you're eating here your food and everything, you basically have all this functionality. Those are all functions that are now focused in warm in the warm module and not anymore in main. Okay. Right, what do we do next? Let's pimp this up a little bit. So the, the first thing we're going to do, I, I, yes, a question. I have a question. Yes. Well, the warm1.cpp is the main function. This is later, I mean, so basically what the, the so I'll, I'll show you the, whoops, the warm1. So here, this basically is the real executable. So here, you since this has the main function, and warm.h and warm.cpp doesn't, those are just a collection of functions you can use. Um, this basically, warm v1, dictates what you're going to do with your program. Warm.h and warm.cpp are basically your own home, home built library that dictate what these particular functions that you're using here are really doing. And this way you can hide everything else. I mean, it's a very good question because in, initially, or when you, see, when you look at this file, you have no idea that the ncurses library is being used. You have no idea that um, std, io, and all the other libraries that we've used are being used. You basically just say, I include my library warm, and the header file is always what you include uh, in, in, such a, in such a case. And then you basically, in your main function, have all, those function, all the functionality from your uh, module without really having to know how this module is being coded. So if you then make a nice documentation where you say, um, always do init first, then you can use um, these particular functions in such a way, anyone else could use your warm module for other purposes, perhaps later on, and you can, uh, and other people can build an executable with exactly that module that you had, with warm.h and warm.cpp. And that's basically what we've seen so far. Okay. And, and uh, uh, the warm.cpp have to include the warm.h 
Yes. Because, because that's, I mean, in our case, yes, and this will become more relevant later, but in our worm.h, we basically tell which libraries we're going to use. So we include there um, end curses and the rest. So we can actually here show what's in worm.h. So basically the, the definition of worm, uh, of what our worm module should be doing is always in the header file. Um, and also what it depends on. So it depends on these three libraries that are standard libraries in this case. Um, and curses is a C library because it ends with .h. The other two are C++ libraries. And it's, we define here already our interface. And that is uh, also a very good question because this interface later is how people are going to interact at the, the most with your library. They're going to look at your header file and they're go, going to see, okay, I have uh, these dependencies, but also I have this functionality in your... It, they will never look at the CPP file or should never look at the CPP file because that is your work and you should basically kind of deal with that. Other people just have to use those files. But in the header, header you declare which functions you have and which functionality later we'll see your uh, library will give. And in the CPP file, you implement all of that. Okay. That's also, oh, that is a, a, a very good question. Um, because, because these are very important concepts that we will build upon the whole time from now on. Right. So what did I want to say now? Or I think I was just answering a question. Right. So any more questions? Yes. Yes, I could also call it anything else. I call it Worm V1 because this is our first version of the Worm, but I could exa exactly, you're right. I mean, this Worm similarity might be confusing. I could also call it snakes or anything else, right? So th 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 this is, this is uh, I mean, the executable can be called anyway. That's what comes after the minus O uh, at the compiled uh, time, but uh, anything else is exactly, you know, we don't have to call this Worm V1.cpp. We can call this any anyway. We want exactly, and also we can change all of this. Of course, we did this now because this is uh, how our program was structured. But um, later we'll see uh, a lot of differences there. So where you can um, in the main function also uh, do certain things. So hopefully, once your library is completely ready, um, you can in the main uh, add lots of parameters and lots of arguments. But we'll see that later. Okay. Any more questions? It's very important that you're up to speed now because it's slowly getting a little bit more complex. Right, so the, I was actually going to say let's add color and all the rest. However, I think we first go, since everybody, I mean, since these questions point to a certain thing, I would say um, let's first cr create a make file. Who is familiar with make files? Almost all, oh, a few, but that's, that's, not, that's not a lot. Now, a make file is what every IDE, integrated development environment, that you normally use for programming, uses anyway. Because what we've done so far is um, we basically executed uh, first this to get our object file, um, then this to get our second object file, and then we link those together with this. It'll be, I mean, this is just for a few files. Um, and we have to constantly do this now over and over again if we change something in our war module. This is a lot of work. And to enable this automatically, or to do this slightly automatically, there is a thing called make, it's a utility that is present in every operating system uh, or every environment that you use. And this relies on a make file. And as you see, I already created with nano a make file. So this is uh, just a file called make file with a capital M, very important. And in this make file, I can declare dependencies and I can do exactly what I'm doing here. Now, a make file starts with a particular target. And the first target that you specify is the default targets. And let's call this warm v1. Or it could also be snakes or whatever. But, you know, we basically call now warm v1. And we can there uh, say which dependencies uh, Worm v1 has. So we start right here at the end. So this is basically what we want to build with our make file. Um, and our dependencies, what, what do we need for this? We need worm.o and worm.v1.o, right? So that's something we can declare right here. So we say worm.o we need, and we need worm.v1.o. 
Those are the dependencies. And then at the next, so what comes next, we basically declare right there what um, our make utility has to do for that. Important is that you start with a tab, and then after the tab, you do exactly what we've done here. So basically, you say our compiler is G, or we basically have exactly the right, uh, the same executable. So we say um, uh, we create executable W1. It will use the object file warm. It will use the uh, object file warm uh, v1, and it will link and curses into that. Now, all we have to do now is also declare these two uh, as uh, as extra targets. So, what make the make utility will do then is say for warm v1, this is what I have to do at all times. I need warm.o and warm v1.o. And for that, I first I go look for next rule sets how to make those. So and then we do there exactly the same. So for warm. .o, I have also certain things I need there, and there we can, for instance, create the files um, that we need for creating warm. And this is warm. .h and warm. .cpp, right? If one of those is missing, we can't create warm. .o. So those are the dependencies of warm uh, the warm object file. And how do we uh, compile this into an object file? Just the same as we saw it earlier. We say warm, uh, oops, compile warm.cpp, right? And we do exactly the same um, for warm uh, v1.o. So all this needs is just one file, namely warm v1.cpp. And what do we do there? We execute G, G, G++ with the compile option and warm v1.cpp, right? So now what will happen is if we uh, use this make utility, it will look at the local make file. It will look for the first target, which is warm v1. And then it will look if those two files are there already and if those uh, need uh, renewing automatically. Um, and therefore execute this and this whenever necessary. And when that is then uh, executed, it will then execute this. So it will do everything for us, what we've done here and more. Because if we now start changing warm.h and warm.cpp, we need new object files. And also this is something that the make file will do for us. It will automatically create or redo these targets, recreate those object files, if those have changed, and then we'll create the executable again. Okay? I think this is the, 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 the trickiest bit. Uh, once we have our make file, the way we do this is a make utility, as I said. We just execute make, and then, we, and then you can see actually what is being executed. If you do like this, you can see ex uh, what is executed. Now, if we change um, warm dot cpp for instance and we do something else for instance um what can we do oh we can start using color we'll do that later but uh, for using color you can do this this is part of the n curses library um function from m curses oops function and we'll continue with that later. I'll save that. So now uh, my CPP function has completely changed and we're using also extra functions from the library. So if I do now make, you'll see that the warm CPP is recompiled into warm.o automatically. Okay? So from now on, instead of constantly recompiling things by hand, we're going to do this with the make utility. You don't have to do this for exercise sheets three where we are now those are still the, the simple things uh, but from exercise sheet four onwards we will use the make utility also in the exercises okay so the executing things will be or compiling things will be easier because we constantly just have to say make and if our make file is well structured like this um, we don't have to do anything else anymore okay right good so let's start using color. So, and now, from now on, I'm not going to use that much anymore our warm v1 executable. 
I'm just going to update and pimp up my uh, warm module and use color there and some other things that you will see in a second. No, not make. Uh, Warm.h. And I'm going to change things here, especially in the CPP file. In the header file, we might also need something later, but the CPP file is where we are going to do the first changes. Um, now, the color is the first thing that I'm going to start because there um, we can do a lot of cool things uh, with N-curses that we have done, haven't done so far yet. Um, and one of the things is we can use color. And for using color, we have to, in the initializations, define that we're going to use color. There, normally, N-curses will also check whether you could use color, whether you have a, uh, an SSH terminal, for instance, that can use color. Nowadays, most of them can. Um, so I'm not going to do any more tests there. Normally, you should, but you know, start color is what you need. Another thing that you need to initialize at the same time for N-curses is something that is called um, init pair. And there you define what colors what type of colors for the characters that you're going to print, like we've done so far, what colors you can use at all. And um, with init pair, you just have to, the function is uh, called like this, you basically have to give it a number, and then you give it a foreground color and a background color. So one is usually the default, so we say the default color is color white as the foreground color and color black, black as the background color. So foreground, background, I'm going to um, do more commenting later, but I think for now this, this shows me that I later have to do that. And we can do this for multiple color pairs. So this way we can say that we want to have this color pair. We have to also have an alternative because why, why else would we um, dictate this? For instance, we can do color green is another one that we could use. Now, how do we use those colors? There are multiple ways we can do this in cursor, but an interesting way, and this is something that the, uh, the reason why I'm going to introduce this, is um, that we do this by having an or of uh, what we do. And in this case, we're going to leave the drawing of the worm exactly the way we had it, but we're going to make our food green. Um, and the way we're doing this is, you know, uh, just as we said before, this function over here is taking a character and is placing it on an XY position on our screen. And as we know, a character is a value between 0 and 255. So it can take 256 values. Uh, or it fits into one byte. However, in the background for n curses, this function is using something that is much larger. It's using an integer, in fact. So multiple bytes. Um, only one byte of that is being used. And the nice thing that we can use here is with the OR um, operator, OR bit operator, we can actually use the rest of those bytes that are usually then zero. If you give it a character, this character is converted to an integer for this function, and it is placed at XY position. However, we can do an OR here um, with, with our uh, color pair. So we, I mean, in, in cursors, we can use, um, this is kind of a macro. We can use color pair two in this case which, you know, as you um, see up there, is basically the foreground is green, the background is black. Um, so with color pair 2, we basically now, instead of saying we just give this character big X to our function, we give this character big X, but since this is an integer, those other bytes are always zero, and those are being filled, or some of those uh, other bytes are being filled with our color specifications. Right? This is something that we will see in lots of libraries and lots of um, other uh, codes, by doing this logical OR, you basically um, do an OR of those uh, uh, zeros that you have elsewhere. So if this color pair is 1111111, for instance, then this is somehow being ORed, and you still have this big X, but those other zeros are being replaced with those color specifications. So if we do this, then normally, if, if, I, if everything is correct, um, I can, let's do it here. I can quit here. I can make the whole thing again, compile, uh, co uh, compile and build our W1 executable. And I can, now I have a, back, uh, a, a black background, as you can see, and I have a green X. So now we have a little worm that is eating 
a leaf, for instance. Right? So that's, that's one thing that we could do now here. And so on. Good. So now we have a bit of color. The next thing that I wanted to do is now we know that this if else, if else, if else is not the best thing or is not the nicest thing. So as we saw in the slides, we can do this as a switch statement. So what do we do to create all of this into one statement? We start with switch. What do we test for? C, exactly. And then we need basically cases, right? So the first case is basically exactly C being equal to, for instance, the character D. And in that case, we don't have to use a compound. You know, from, from what comes now, um, uh, we basically can now list everything that character D does. And we can do exactly this right over here. So I can just whoops, put this here. Up, and put this right here. Or I can actually put this like this. This is a little bit nicer, I think. And as we saw, break to make sure that then the switch statement is, is exited, right? Um, and we do exactly the same for A. Um, I'll do the first the cases. Then we have also W. We have S. And then, as I said, default is always good to have as well. Even though we won't do anything in the default set for now. Good. So what do we do? So this is moving right. We already did. Let's also make sure that um, we comment this so that later we can see this still. So A is move left. W is move up. And S is move down. Down is written like this. Um, and then we also add a break for all of those. There we go. Like this, for instance. And then we basically add those where they are needed. So for A, we need to do this. Indentation, always important. For W, we do this. And for S, we do this. Okay, so this is a little bit easier to read now. So we switch on C, so now we go multiple ways. If we have a D, we do that. If we have an A, we do that. If we have a W, we do that. And if we have an S, we do that. Default, we don't do anything, and then we continue, okay? And since C could be any out of uh, 256 values, we only test for four. And for the rest, we don't do anything. That's kind of what you or how you should interpret this switch statement. And this is a lot easier, I think, to read than the if else, if else, if else that we had before, right? Okay, let's test this one more time. So again, oops. Oh, what did I do? Where is the where is the error? Line fifty three. A primary expression. Okay, so it's it's expecting a, uh, an expression right here, right? Did I did I miss something, or is it, it is exactly the fact that we have defaults and nothing else? So if I do break, will that? Yes. Okay, so break after defaults. I I almost forgot about that myself. Good. So now it works. Let's see if it still works the way we intended to do. Can it still eat a leaf? Yes. Good. So now the next thing we're going to do, which I've been promising already for a while, is we are going to not have a baby worm of size 2, but we're going to have a worm that is a little bit longer. Where do we start with that? We start with that with the coordinates. Because we now have just one coordinate that is dictating how our worm should be drawn with this trick that we first print the body, then we ask for user input, and then we print the head in a new location, right? And the body we print where the head was. That's something we can't do. We're going to use now arrays. Uh, so instead of having one uh, integer, we're going to have, how long shall our worm be? Five? A bit more, perhaps? <laughs> okay, you like, you like nice round numbers? Good, let's go, let's, let's go for 10. 
Um, so we have now 10 x and y coordinates that dictate where the worm should be drawn, right? What you see is that, you, and I didn't do this equal one because you can't do this for an array. If you want to initialize an array, this is something that we'll see next week, um, we have to initialize this array by hand. And what we have to do there is we have to use our old trusty for loop or, so, or a while loop. A while loop would also be working here. But the way we do this is basically for each and one of those 10 characters, we're going to set it equal to zero or we're going to set it to zero. So just like we've seen, you can go and start at zero, for instance. Oops, uh, what am I doing here? There. Um, where do we stop? At nine. At nine. So basically, so we, we go from zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah. Ten is not possible anymore. If we define an array of ten, then it has ten integers, and those are indexed from zero to nine. Also very important, we'll get used to that, and there will be many errors that way. Still happens all the time. And we increment this i. So what do we do then? We basically say that the i element of the array x is then equal to, uh, to 0. And we do exactly the same, for instance, for our i element of, um, of y. Right. So now we basically make sure that we start with 0, 0 for all the, co all the 10 coordinates of our warm segment. Right? And this is something that is necessary. That's something you can't do immediately straight from the start. Another thing that you see is that we use 10 now here the whole time as um, a number, as a constant in our codes. This is also fairly bad coding. We'll do that in a second or probably next week. Um, because what if we want to make our warm a little bit longer? We'll have to then go throughout our code and change every 10 into a 20. Um, and this is not only a lot of work, but this can also lead to errors because if we then change one 10 that meant something else, this could be meaning something else again, right? Or could be leading to, to some other errors. This is something that we don't want. But we'll, for now, it's still manageable. We just say our warm is size 10 and that's it. Now, all the rest we have to do is in our draw warm function. And in our draw warm function, we basically have to change x and y all the time, right? So there we basically have uh, our trick where we first draw the body and then we... Um, we test uh, what our user is doing, what, what the worm should do next. Um, that we can't do anymore. Uh, so let's get, the, 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 get that out of the way. This draw um, comment is actually for the function itself, I would say. So we can even do that. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to do exactly the same trick. So uh, we're going to first say where all the body segments should go. And we're going to move those to the head of the worm. So, and then where the head of the worm should be drawn is at the end. So we're going to shift, um, shift the worm's body towards the head. I hope that is kind of clear what I mean by that. So basically all the segments should go to where the head was. So now we have to also think about where the head of the worm should be. I would say the head of the worm should be at place zero, zero in our area. So X, 0 and y0 are going to be the heads, and all the rest is what follows. I think that makes sense, right? That means, also here, we need to do a, a new for loop, uh, and for every segment, we're going to uh, shift this one thing up. So we're not going to change the heads, the coordinates of the heads, but we're going to change the coordinates of everything else. So um, x... 1 will then become x, uh, will get the value from x0, for instance, and y1 will get the value of y0. But this then in a loop all the time. Now, we could do this with our simple loop that we had before. Say i equals 0. Oh, what am I? Yeah. i is smaller than 10. Same thing, right? And we increment i. Now, and then we could basically say x. Oh, no, we can start at 1, right? And we could say x i and y i become the value of x i minus 1 and i minus 1. Conceptually, I would say that makes sense. Um, so basically, then x1 becomes the value, gets the value of x0, and y1 gets the value of y0. However, why is this wrong? 
This is a good example of why loops are not always that clear cut. Anyone an idea? This would be totally wrong conceptually. Uh, I will keep on being one. I will keep on being one? But in that case, we don't get the value of nine. That's why k equal to y nine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So if you follow the loop, so basically you start at one. So x1 get the value of x0. Then the next one, x2, will get the value of x1. But this was x0, right? Or x3 will get the value of x2, but this was x1, which is also x0. So you basically put everything uh, to x0. So this is why we have to do something here to fix this. Now, who has a good idea of how we can do this? We can start at the end. To the For instance. Was this also what you're going to say? Yeah. So, so basically, this is indeed what we can do. We can start at i equals 9, right? So we start at 9, and then basically say, do exactly the same. We have to just make sure that i then stops. And first of all, i needs to decrement. So basically, it should decrease by 1. And it should uh, stop at 1. So as long as it's bigger than 0, it should be fine. Right? We could also do bigger or equal to 1, but now nah, let's, let's do bigger than 0. This is much nicer. Um, here we evaluate, evaluate the user input. That's what comes out. So basically here we already have shifted towards body, uh, the worm's body, however long it might be. Here you evaluate the user inputs, and instead of drawing just the head, we're going to draw the worm here. The whole body. And that we can do again with a for loop. You see, this is a very good exercise for a for loop. Um, and what do we do there? I would say, well, it doesn't matter. So um, there we can immediately do our typical uh, for loop where i starts at 0. Um, i is always smaller than 10. So we go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way to 9. And we increment 9 at each um, instance for the loop. And then how was um, drawing done? That's where we use exactly this function over here. Um, increment a bit, and we draw the heads not on x, y, but on x, i, and uh, y, i, at those coordinates. Okay? So now we draw basically these big O's everywhere where our worm should be. So we first here shift the worm towards the head. We don't know where our head is going. Here we evaluate where the head should be going, well, what the user wants. And then we draw on top of that uh, the whole worm's body. So the, the head comes at a new position and um, the worm's body will, uh, will have to follow. So the only thing that is missing is that these x and y's that we have here should be changed into x zeros and x y, um, and x zeros, uh, y zeros and x zeros, right? So this is basically defining where the heads should be positioned. And in the beginning, this is zero. And depending on which keys you have, it will then increment or, or, or decrease. Okay? Where? Who? What? Where? Did I put in... Where? Which line? Yes? For D, yes. Yeah, the switch, the switch segment. Yes. So we won't be working with the I subscripts, like I change. No, no. We basically here going to just change the value of the first uh, position in both our uh, arrays. So we have an X and a Y array, yeah. and on the first position, we're going to say this is where the head is. And here, in the switch statement, we're going to see where this head should go. Whether it should go left, right, up, or down. And by the next, uh, uh, in the next iteration, our worm's body will follow where that head has been. So the first segment will go where the head was, the second where the first segment was, the third where the second segment was, and so on. Okay? I know this is a little bit, a little bit hard to follow sometimes, but well, this is what programming is. Um, and and I think I think uh, for the for loop this is an excellent uh, an excellent example of how things should be. Okay, are we done now? Precompilers, yes. What happens if the case A and case W one the wall made at the boundary of the screen? Yeah, but the heads 
the duration of the head is equal to the second. Exactly. That's exactly what will happen. So basically, the worm will be compressed um, or getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Exactly. We can. I mean, we, we could also um, remedy that. Maybe let's do that later, uh, because that's a good point. Um, so let's 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 make this whole thing again. Oops. Ah, foods. Exactly. So on lines uh, sixty-nine, I have used still x and y. Ah, uh, there we go. Exactly. I've forgotten all, all about that. So what do we test here? We test whether the food is eaten, right? Um, maybe we should also comment that to make it nicer. Um, test if the food is being eaten. There. If it's being eaten, then we basically say if the head is in the right position where the food is, right? Uh, and that basically our head was at place zero, we said, right? There we go. So if food X is at the X position of the head, if food Y is at the Y position of the head, then it's eating, then we need to change the food coordinates. Okay. Those were the two errors for X and for Y. So I would assume that if I do make now, it works. Now let's see if our worm is indeed a bit longer now. Oh, nice. Right, so... So our, our worm is indeed a bit longer, and um, the area of coordinates does work as we intended it. Okay, we're getting there. We're slowly getting there to a nice game. Good.